So what do you do when you have an extremely successful SaaS business that's doing multiple millions a year in annual recurring revenue, but then you have a new idea for a software tool? Do you go and build that software tool? How do you determine how quickly you want to grow a business? Do you look at the bottom line, the profits, or do you just scale as quickly as possible and potentially even raise funds? How important is content marketing and podcasting in growing a successful business? These are all questions that we answer in this interview today with Laura Roeder. Laura is an extremely successful entrepreneur, very well known in the space. She is the founder of Meet Edgar, which is over at meetedgar.com. And she is also the founder of a new software tool called Paperbell. And of course, you can check that out as well over at paperbell.com. I really enjoyed this discussion with Laura, not only because she is a multiple product SaaS founder, but also because she gives some really actionable advice as she shares her story here. She talks about strategies that have worked really well to grow and expand Meet Edgar, but then also things that are working well uh, in her new company, and then maybe some things that aren't working quite as well. Um, not everything is perfect with her new startup. Um, after the success of Meet Edgar, which did over a million dollars in annual recurring revenue in less than 12 months, to have a company that's only doing six figures a year and just barely six figures a year is something of a change. And so it's really fascinating to hear uh, the discussion that Laura uh, has here as she answers some of my questions and to get an inside look into the entrepreneurial mind and uh, what she's working on and what's working well. So if you have a coaching business, Paperbell may be the software tool for you. Paperbell is a software that not only schedules and takes payments, but handles the entire process of booking coaching and client calls that you are accepting money for. So you can check that out at paperbell.com. But overall, I really hope that you enjoy this interview with Laura Roeder. Hey, Laura, welcome to the Niche Pursuits podcast. Thank you, Spencer. I was sitting here wondering, is he going to say niche or niche? Which side Uh, is he on? So now, now I know you're a niche man. I'm I'm a niche man, and uh, I know you're in the UK right now, and so you're you know probably people are swaying you to niche uh, over there. But I might uh, have to go niche. Yeah, maybe we'll we'll just mix it up. Yeah, we'll keep people guessing. You know, um, <laughs> I, I go niche, but whatever whatever happens happens, and and that's cool. So uh, very good. So yeah, you are in the UK, and we're talking before mm-hmm. uh, you moved from Austin. Sounds like a few years ago. And you're now sort of raising a family, right? You've got uh, how many now? Two or? Yes, I have a two-year-old and a six-year-old. Yeah, and I live here in Brighton in England. Awesome. Yeah, very, very good. Yeah, starting the young family. Uh, I'm a family guy. And so it's always great to connect with other entrepreneurs that are raising families and and juggling Mm -hmm. both, right? Making it happen. So I can appreciate that very much. So I'd like to give people kind of a background on who you are. Um, some of the history um, that has led you to to where you are now. And um, many years ago, you started a company called LKR that kind of helped companies do their social media. Mm -hmm. Um, And can you can you explain why you started that and kind of what led you to that? Yeah, so uh, to make it a little bit longer, the first business I started was really as a web designer um, and graphic designer designing logos and business cards and websites that was in 2007 and that parlayed into helping the businesses uh, that I was doing their websites helping them with their social media and so I started doing some social media consulting and I very quickly discovered the world of uh, info products now they've been upgraded to online courses which is great right. because that sounds much better than info products. Info products I, is a terrible name. That's right. It's not just an <laughs> ebook anymore. Right, yeah. right. Um, so yeah, so I did online courses about social media marketing, 
uh, for a long time. And in 2014, that became a social media marketing software, which is Meet Edgar. Um, and then last year in 2020, I launched uh, another software business, which is called Paperbell, which is for coaches, like life coaches, business coaches to run their business. Yeah. And so you've done a lot of really interesting things. Um, and we're going to kind of cover that whole span a little bit. Um, and to get to where you are today, of course, with Paperbell. But uh, yeah, you, you you launched Meet Edgar, I think you said in 2014. Mm -hmm. And uh, it sounds like the reason for that was, um, well, you you tell me, you know, you probably saw the need there because you're managing so many social media profiles and social media clients, but maybe give us a little bit of the genesis of the idea there. Yeah. So when I launched that, I actually wasn't doing any uh, service work. It was all okay. it was all teaching. So yeah, I wasn't. I've actually okay. never done social media management, um, like as a as a service. I've sort of consulted on it, and then I've done training, teaching people how to you know manage it themselves. So uh, basically, what happened is I saw that the way most entrepreneurs were and still are managing their social media marketing was a massive waste of time because people were coming up with multiple new updates every day forever. So I start looking into the stats of social media and seeing these numbers and being like, okay, only a tiny percentage is seeing any tweet, Facebook update. But the numbers are even lower now than they were you know, right. in 2014. Organic reach has continued to drop. And I thought, why would I come up with new stuff every day, I should just create a library and be repurposing a library of content on social media. So I was actually teaching people to do that manually using a really complicated color-coded spreadsheet. So yeah, the software idea was like, why, why am I using a spreadsheet? <laughs> why, why, software could do this. Why is a human doing this? You know, right. Let's build software to automatically do the social media process I was teaching. Yeah, so uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and were you getting a lot of um, of your clients kind of saying, hey, this is a lot of manual work? Was that a lot of the feedback that you were getting? Or was it really just, hey, you could see that you're teaching this process that, I mean, it's going to take these clients hours to do, and you mm -hmm. kind of just recognize that. Yeah, it wasn't so much feedback from them because I don't think they saw another way. I don't think it would have occurred to them sure. to say, oh, this is a lot of work because it was just how how it is. That's and how actually, it's done. yeah. So um, my husband, Chris, is a developer. I'm not a software developer myself. So it was really, he's the one who saw what I was teaching and heard me complain about it and said, yeah, I could build software that does that because I was kind of like, I was kind of like my clients. I'm like, well, I guess software, I guess software can't do it. I don't know. It seems really obvious to me that software should do this because, you know, when we launched Edgar, we were not the first social media marketing tool. Um, right. You know, Buffer already existed. Hootsuite already existed, but they didn't and still don't give you a library of your updates. It's just like put an update in and they send it out, but then you have to keep doing that over and over again. So I, I kind of thought, oh, well, I guess there's some good reason, you right, know, there must the be. social media tools, right. Don't do this. So it really took Chris saying like, no, we could, we could build a tool uh, that does this. And now I know that anything, anything you can do on the computer software can do. So for anyone listening, who's like, could I build a software that can do that? Yes. Someone can. That is so very true. And <laughs> hopefully there's somebody listening, right? That can kind of take that idea. If like you're using mm -hmm. a spreadsheet in particular, right. right? Like you can probably automate and make your life a whole lot easier. Maybe a lot of other people's lives uh, easier and build a successful business uh, in the process. And so um, Meet Edgar became uh, very successful very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've done lots of... Um, interviews and you've been very open with sort of some of the numbers that uh, Edgar achieved it like in the first year, I think it was like seven figures, you know, within the first year yeah. uh, and revenue that it was doing. So grew very quickly right out of the gate. Um, what do you think is the reason that it grew so quickly early on? Well, you know, it's been interesting because now I'm doing my next SaaS company and we haven't grown as quickly as paper, you know, we're coming up to a year now and we definitely have not reached that million dollars in annual reoccurring revenue in our first year. Or so yeah. um, you have so much more perspective. You know, I know that you've done a bunch of projects. The great thing about doing a bunch of projects is you start to discover more what is strategic, what's just luck, because often you have luck and you think you've come up with a brilliant strategy <laughs> and then you're 
then you try yeah. to do it again and you're like, oh, wait, maybe, like, maybe I doesn't just got always to be apply. Lucky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think with Edgar, you know, we had a lot of forces conspiring in our favor. So one, we did come up with something truly innovative and it was sort of a perfect mix. I, I think it's great to be in an industry where the, the industry already exists, but you have some innovation to add on top of it. Because, you know, a lot of people are scared to go into a crowded market. But the great thing about a crowded market is that your customers are already looking for you. So when we're convincing someone to buy Meet Edgar, we're not introducing an, the idea of a tool to manage your social media. They already know they want a social media scheduling tool. They're deciding which one, you know? Right. So we're like, oh, well, here's why you should choose Edgar. It saves you a lot more time, you know, automates a lot more. Um, whereas with Paperbell, we're much more inventing a new category. Most coaches do not use a competitive software. They don't use a software like Paperbell to manage their business. So it's a lot harder. You know, we have a big opportunity to introduce something new, but we're not saying, oh, switch from that to Paperbell. We're saying, what if you had software that ran your business for you? And they're like, oh, okay, I guess that sounds interesting. I don't know. Also, right. scary. Yeah. So I, I think it was a lot of right place, right time where we were going into an industry that people, you know, they knew they needed a social media tool, but we were really able to offer something really compelling. Yeah, you know, it, it makes sense looking back, you know, the time frame of like 2014, like the social media um, market was was young, but mm -hmm. more mature, like it wasn't like mm -hmm. brand new, right? Like people were yeah. using a lot of um, scheduling tools already. Uh, mm -hmm. But then you introduce something innovative, right? Something that did something a little bit different than than buffer and the other scheduling tools did. And so yeah, right place, right time, certainly part of it. But I, I know that you did a lot of marketing, a lot of hustling, yeah. um, mm -hmm. things that clearly helped, you know, sort of pull, uh, pour gasoline on the fire there. Um, and I think I read or it, maybe even watched a YouTube video um, back in the day you were talking about, and I could be wrong because this is a long time ago, um, talking about how podcasting actually was a yeah. big part of the growth of um, Edgar. And so... Uh, is that the case? And, and maybe talk about mm -hmm. that strategy a little bit, how important you felt like podcasting was. Yeah. So I have been a guest on over 200 podcasts, wow. I've done a lot of podcast interviews. Um, and that has been a big growth driver, but you know, I think not maybe in exactly the way that people would expect. Uh, so my advice on doing podcast interviews is not, don't create individual landing pages, do not create individual coupon codes because mm. it's a cumulative effect. You know, there's been, uh, I always say Pat Flynn is like the only, <laughs> Pat Flynn is like right, the only podcast. Right, can drive the results. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where we actually see like a big chunk of, oh, Pat Flynn. <laughs> but like, you know, out of the hundreds of other podcasts of, you know, all varying sizes, it's really just that the little, little bit all adds up together. So for a while we were trying to track it all. And if you try to track it individually, uh, you will be very disappointed, you know, then, and the other thing about podcasts is that people very often don't go to the landing page that you said, they don't use the coupon code. They just Google you and they might Google you six months later. I think it's more often a branding effect where maybe they hear you on the podcast and then a friend mentions you. And then when the friend mentions you, they take the recommendation a bit more serious. They're like, Oh, I've heard of that company. Actually, I heard the founder on a podcast. So I think, you know, people want to do podcast campaigns and they're like, okay, I'm going to track, you know, how many people came in from each podcast and did they convert? We have not seen that you can track it that way, but we have seen that it's a very effective way to just get your company name in, in front of your audience. Right. And that, that's the, the catch 22 of podcasting. It always has been, is that it's really hard to track this specific mm -hmm. results to an exact episode uh, because just the way tracking works, like you said, they are listening while they're in their car or out mm -hmm. running. And then it might be two weeks later that they finally get around to just Googling it. And there's no way to tie that they listened to that episode, you know, two weeks ago. Yeah. And you know, the other cool thing about podcasts is that they are evergreen, you know, people continuously discover podcasts. And when you discover one that you like, you often go back and listen 
to old episodes. So even podcasts that I did five years ago, whether they're still active now or not, can still find new listeners that might go back through the episodes. So it's just, you know, as opposed to paid ads, the thing about which we also have used over the years, but Mm -hmm. what I always point out about paid ads is when you turn the money off, the traffic drops to zero. It's very all or nothing, you know, like either I am giving Google a dollar or I'm not, if I'm not giving them a dollar, they are not showing my ad where more organic channels like podcasts, I do this work, I put it out there. It lives on the internet forever. I don't have to keep doing anything. I don't have to keep paying for it for people to be able to discover it years and years down the road. Yeah. And it's absolutely true. I look at my podcast, you know, I've been running my podcast for several years and I'll look at even some of those early episodes and it's not a lot of downloads, right? Right. That I did five, six, seven years ago, but it is some like every month, Mm -hmm. like even if it's like 10 or 20 listens, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's 10 or 20 people that are listening to an episode that you recorded years and years ago. And so, um, so would you say that that was definitely one of the the biggest reasons uh, for the success of Edgar, or were there a couple other marketing strategies you felt like were maybe more important? Uh, so, you know, it's funny because, like we said, it's I'm really just guessing at the answer. So when we look at how people discover Edgar now. All we know is that they type meet Edgar into Google. <laughs> they type meet Edgar into Google and then they start a trial and then they buy Edgar. So we know that they heard about it somehow. They heard about it from a Facebook group, from a review someone wrote online, from a podcast that they listened to. So what I know works is all the activity that we've done, um, it, you know, that I would just call content marketing, you know, so it's blogging on our own blog, it's doing joint webinars, it's doing guest posts, and it hasn't really been any one thing of all those things. But we have always been very consistent in just keeping our content marketing mix going. Mm-hmm. So if there's a maybe a, a newer SaaS founder out there that's listening that is kind of looking for, okay, they've got their product, they're they're launching it, what are, you know, two or three of the either either content marketing or just mm-hmm. things, activities they should be focusing on in their first year to, to really hit that growth? Yeah, I mean, so I can I can tell you this because I'm doing it myself, right? Because I have another company that I just started. So um, two of the big strategies that we're pursuing there are one is blogging right from day one and very SEO focused blogging, which is something that actually we haven't done well at Meet Edgar. We've always blogged and we've always blogged about topics that our audience wanted to know about, social media marketing topics. Our focus on SEO has been kind of on and off, kind of shaky, has not been consistent where I look at um, Buffer, who's always done an excellent job with their SEO and has always created great content. They are ranking for everything. We yes, are not are. ranking for everything, you know? <laughs> so it's it's an interesting comparison because it's like company A and company B, we both have good content. We're both writing about the same topics, but I can see the results where they've been much more strategic about their SEO. So right. um, with Paperbell, you know, we're being much more strategic about the articles that we're writing, all based on keyword research, not just what we think our audience might want to hear about, because I know that if we start building that up today, three years from now, we have, you know, we'll be in those top spots for our topics. So that's one. Um, another thing that I do with Paperbell is I'm a member of, I don't know how many, like 60 Facebook groups for coaches. Um, it's oh, wow. one of those industries that's very active on Instagram, that's very active on Facebook. And Again, it's less of a specific strategy. It's more just a way to get to know our audience. So it's not that I'm a super frequent poster. I'm not doing that thing where I like pretend I'm offering advice and then I try to hide a pitch into the <laughs> into the post right. on Facebook. Um, but I will say something that I've done that's very you know actionable that other people can use is I regularly search the Facebook groups for uh, like we do scheduling at Paperbell. So I'll search the Facebook group for tools like. Calendly and Acuity, other scheduling tools. Yep. And so when people ask, what scheduling tool do you use? I'll suggest Paperbell. And again, it actually ends up being an evergreen thing because people see the new post, but people do also tend to search Facebook yep. groups um, for common questions like that to see what other people have recommended. 
So it's another one of those that you can't really, you know, we see we get some organic traffic from Facebook. We can't track it, unfortunately, beyond that. I have no way of seeing which posts or which groups, but it's a way for me to consistently get my name out there, get people familiar with Paperbell, and just be present in a place where our customers are having really interesting discussions. Yeah. So uh, with, with Paperbell, you talk about your uh, content strategy. How, how much content are you trying to produce? Do you have like a minimum, hey, we're trying to do four blogs a month or something like that? Yeah, we've been doing uh, two posts a week um, okay. for how many months now? Probably about six months now. I'm thinking about dropping it to one a week because we've hit a lot of the, there's only a little bit of content where people type in four coaches in Google. Right. You know, there's a lot of stuff coaches look for without typing in for coaches. The stuff you can see they type in for coaches, there's only so many of those. Right, um, we've kind of hit on those, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I, and I am thinking about being a lot better about updating as well, because now this is something we're circling back to with Edgar. With Edgar, we're focusing on our content marketing, on updating and optimizing our old posts because we've written hundreds and hundreds of blog posts over the years. So many of them have just sat there, but you know, Google loves old content. Mm -hmm. um, so with Paperbell, I'm thinking much more about how can we create a system where we just have like a great body of work that just gets better every year. So instead of always trying to think of something new to blog about, if, if we keep updating the same posts, they'll get really, really good yeah. <laughs> over the years, you know? So I'm thinking of our content much more that way of just having a great body of knowledge that keeps getting better instead of what's the post of the week, what's the post of the week. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense, right? You've, you Hopefully you, you hone in on sort of your key key keywords that you're trying mm -hmm. to rank for. You've got this core set of, you know, a couple dozen keywords. And if you've got that content, you can go back and continually be updating it uh, and just making it better and better. Um, that I think that's a smart strategy. Google values updated content. And I've mm -hmm. seen huge results when I go in, I'll take an article that's, you know, two or three years old, update it. Uh, Google definitely gives it a boost. Um, you know, especially when you're using maybe tools or Surfer SEO or Market mm -hmm. Muse, right? That can help you sort of target sort of the latent semantic keywords in, in your article and it can do a lot better. So I think that is a really smart strategy to be doing that. Um, so to, to kind of uh, hit back on Edgar and then we'll move on to Paperbell, can you give us an idea of how well Edgar is, is doing today as a business? Yeah, so Edgar um, has, you know, definitely had some ups and downs and growth before we recorded. Mm -hmm. You were uh, referencing my startups for the rest of us episode yes. where I talked about where we had a big dip in our growth. So go listen to that if you want to hear the whole terrible, <laughs> the whole terrible story. Yes. And I um, do encourage people to listen to that. It's uh, There's a lot of good lessons there, but I didn't want to make uh, Laura here relive uh, through that. But uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So we've, we've definitely had our ups and downs, um, but we are at a few million a year ARR. Um, we are growing awesome. again month over month, not, you know, anything massive, but we are growing a little bit every month. So yeah, That's it feels great. good to be back on that, that growth track. So how, how much of your time are you spending on Edgar versus Paperbell now? So I spend almost all my time on Paperbell. Um, okay. And I actually have for a few years. So we've had a team that runs Edgar um, for about three or four years now. I've been pretty out of it, actually pretty entirely. Um, just having kind of like a weekly uh, check-in with leadership, which you know doesn't have to happen every week. So yeah, so Edgar is something that I was very active in in the beginning and then kind of turned over to a team to, to run. Yeah, you know, I think that's... Um... Maybe the dream for a lot of people, right, is to be able to build up a business that you can then have others actually run, especially if um, you're an entrepreneur that has lots of ideas, which certainly you are yeah. one of those, <laughs> right, um, to be able to turn it over to a team and, and let them uh, run that. And uh, so now you're, you're focusing your time on Paperbell. And that, that was actually while you were talking about posting in Facebook groups and going on podcasts and doing all these things for Paperbell. My question was, is, are you really doing all of that, right? Are you really the one sending out all your outreach emails? Are you, are you really kind of in those early day, days with, with Paperbell where you're 
really on the ground floor doing it. I am. I am. Yeah. I mean, I don't do, you know, we have freelancers that help. Like I don't write the blog posts, um, sure. but I'm doing a lot of things myself, which is really fun because it's been a while since I've done that for Edgar. I've been much more in a management role with Edgar for a long time. So just getting to go into the website and change whatever I want and not have to like explain to people like, Oh, I deleted that page you made and replaced it with a totally new one. You know, when you have a team, you can't just sort of go in with your wrecking ball and, and do right. whatever That's true. you feel like, you know, but with Paperbell, I can. So, um, yes, the Facebook groups is, is all, all me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that's good. Right. I mean, I guess, is that good? I mean, do you enjoy doing that? Do you enjoy being able to sort of start something new from the ground up again? Yeah. And I think I suspect it'll continue to be a cycle for me because I like both sides. You know, I like going in there and being hands-on. I also love the freedom of not having to do anything. So, you know, I'm always working on finding that balance. And I feel like I have that balance pretty well with Paperbell because, because my businesses don't involve any sort of sales component or any sort of client servicing component. So, you know, with Paperbell and Edgar, we've never had a sales team. I've never done um, demos of any kind, you know. So right. because it's all it's all self-serve, it's all content marketing, it does allow me to be hands-on but still have a good amount of freedom because if I want to work less or not work one week, nothing falls apart. It's not like, oh, I had 20 customer calls set up. I can't just not show up for those, you know. Right. Yeah. So I have a, a somewhat selfish question here because I am in the early days of building a, a mm. SaaS, you know, company. I own Link Whisper. It's a, a WordPress plugin and it's doing well and it's growing. Uh, and so I wanted to ask you as somebody that has owned a fast growing company, kind of when do you decide to hire? And, and maybe you can talk about mm. this with Paperbell, right? You went through it with Edgar um, and, and Paperbell, of course, is hopefully, you know, going to get there where you start to replace some of the tasks that you're doing, um, how do you decide when it's time to make a big hire? And I guess part of the um, genesis of this question is also just thinking about bootstrapping, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're both bootstrappers, you know, we kind of either self-fund or only use the money that the business is generating, right? So yeah, maybe talk through that thought process of, okay, is the company really ready to make a big hire? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a few different ways to look at it. So one, you know, with Paperbell, we have a profit margin goal where we, and so, okay, to be really clear, I cheat. So right now it's my husband and myself working on the business. We don't pay ourselves because we get paid from Edgar. So yeah. that would obviously okay. normally be the biggest expense, which doesn't exist, you know? Yep. Um, so with Paperbell, we try to have 20% profit margin, which means we keep 20%, but which means we try to spend the other 80%. So like what that can look like is like right now I'm just blatantly overspending on Facebook ads that are not converting because I'm trying to force myself to spend money. And I'm like, maybe it's just going to be awareness money. We're going to keep working on this. We're going to keep figuring out this formula. But um, I think a lot of bootstrappers, I know I can, can be too tight with money um, and really inhibit my own growth. So for me, I have to kind of set like a spending goal yeah. <laughs> and then try to think, okay, if I have to spend this much money, what can I, is it, you know, through freelancers to do these activities? Is it, you know, through ad spend? And then you can discover how to improve that spend. You're like, okay, well, I tried, you know, I tried hiring a freelancer to do partnerships and I got no results from it. So it's like, okay, well now I've, I've tried that avenue. But I think when you spend money, it forces you to actually try doing it instead of just thinking about it. Um, and to be clear, it's not like I'm just done with partnerships now because this one little, you know, initiative didn't work out, but I just, it's so right. easy to sit around being like, should I do SEO or ads or partnerships? It's like spend a thousand bucks on each, see yeah. what happens, see, you know, what you like about it and what you don't like about it. Um, and I think the other big thing about spending is that as a bootstrapped company, you don't have, <laughs> you don't have huge reserves in the bank. So it's very normal not to have the annual salary in the bank when you hire the person. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we're often, we're looking at, let's say you're looking to hire someone at 60K a year and you're like, oh man, with all the other 
taxes and stuff, that's going to be, I don't know what, 75 K. And I don't, I, that sounds like a ton of money, but it's like, okay, but you don't pay 75 K you pay a month at a right. time. And obviously you don't want to be super irresponsible and just, you know, when you only have one month and then the, you're going to go out of business after sure. that, like you need to have a little cushion, but as a bootstrapper, you don't need to have the whole year because you want to be hiring people that hopefully can add revenue to your business, right? That's the whole, that's the yeah. whole idea. Yep. Of course, that that takes time, but that is certainly the idea. Um, so I like this uh, sort of 80-20, so the the 20% profit margin. How did you come up with that? Is that something that you saw somewhere else or some advice you received? Just kind of curious where, where that came from. I mean, you know, profit margin is different for different industries, but I think 20% is a pretty good standard, like very healthy profit margin. It's not obviously, you know, if you run a service business or sometimes um, online courses or something like that, you might have like 80% profit margin, right? You're not talking about that, but you're also talking about enough where, you know, if your profit margin is like 10% and then you're a little below, it's 5%. But then if you're a little below that, now you've gone to 0% mm -hmm. and you're out of business. Yeah. <laughs> so I just find that 20 is high enough to give you some sort of, some you know, if you miss there. it by 5%, yeah, you're still at 15, which is still, which is still okay. Um, and then, you know, with Paperbell, I'm using a lot more freelancers than I did for Edgar. And I think that's a big trend right now is to have a lot more freelance and a lot less full time. Um, and of course, you know, the agility and the flexibility is so much higher with freelancers because you can hire people just for a specific project. And then it's fine if you decide not to continue doing that project. Right. Yep. That is the great thing, right? It's not a big deal. That's what they expected to come on for, right? Mm -hmm. as, as a freelancer, whereas full-time employee, you can't just like change your mind a couple months later. That kind of hurts. Right. Um, right. So I, I like that sort of establishing a profit margin that uh, you're willing to spend, right? If you have to, like you said, almost even overspend or at least force yourself to think mm -hmm. of ideas, okay, the, the purpose is to, to grow this company. Um, and so maybe talk about your, your mindset there just a little bit more between scaling as quickly as possible versus sort of that bootstrapping mentality, right? Because certainly... Um, you could go out and raise money and, and mm -hmm. scale companies, right, uh, even faster. But um, yeah, maybe talk about that mindset a little bit between, yeah, just scaling as quickly as possible versus sort of this bootstrap mentality. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, freedom is a huge motivator in how and why I run my businesses. So as some people say everyone has a boss. I, I think I don't have a boss. <laughs> yeah. I think I really, I really don't. I have people that I have made agreements with, right? Like I have other humans that I've made various like agreements and understandings and commitments with. But if I want to just not do anything for the next year, like no one is mad, you know, I'm not <laughs> like I can. It's, right. You can only be mad with yourself, right? Like there's nobody right. looking after you. Right, right. So for me, um, that's a big motivator in staying bootstrapped is to truly not have a boss, not have investors in the business that I'm, you know, stressed about. Um, even if they weren't applying pressure, I would just feel like, okay, these people invested money in my business. I can't take off for a year. I need to be earning them, <laughs> growing the right. business, earning them money. That's, you know, that's why they invested. So um, I am definitely a, a huge, huge fan of bootstrapping. And I think the slower growth that can come with bootstrapping as opposed to raising money. Although I don't, it's not really fair to look at it that way because I think uh, the vast majority of companies that make money fail, you know, just shut down entirely. We sort of have this weird point of view that they all have an exit or get acquired. Um, but most of them don't, most of them just don't just run out of money and don't work out. <laughs> you yeah. know, that happens all the time. So it's not this black and white choice of like, oh, do I want to raise money and grow fast and be really successful or bootstrap and be a little less successful or have a little less growth. But, um, you know, of course, also the joy of bootstrapping is that you get to keep all of your profit margin. You get to decide how much to pay yourself. I've always paid myself well in my businesses. Um, I'm not of the mindset of like, oh, reinvest all the money and then 
someday, you know, you might make money. I'm like, no, I, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I, I want to make money. money. Along the way. <laughs> right? I want, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Hopefully. And then if you, if you can sell something, if you have a sellable business at the end, great, but I don't think you should wait for that until you, until you pay yourself. So basically I'm, I'm very happy with the quote unquote slower pace. And I don't think it's that much of a trade-off because you can do things like, okay, maybe my business isn't as big. Maybe my business makes a hundred K a year and not a million, but I keep a huge amount of that money. Right. And that's offset by the lower stress, right? Mm -hmm. The, the lifestyle business that hopefully you've built for yourself. And, uh, that, that goes a long way. Uh, you know, as I, I look at my own business, having lower stress, uh, and yeah. life and, and being able to take that extra vacation or yeah, if you don't feel like working that day, that's fine. And, and that goes a long way, uh, beyond just sort of the pocketbook as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so if, uh, meet Edgar, which is doing well, um, if, if it's doing so well, why go start something new? right? You, you've got something that, you know, it sounds like you're able to draw a salary on. Um, you know, why, why start Paperbell? I mean, I probably shouldn't have <laughs> <laughs> because I do think it probably usually makes more sense just to focus and grow the thing that's already working. But, you know, I'm an entrepreneur and I get, yeah. I get bored and have, have other ideas. Um, there were also some actually logistical things as well, you know, moving from the U.S. to the U.K. Um, our our Edgar team is all in the U.S. and we're not like a work all night, work whenever type of team. Like the business is very much run on U.S. hours. Um, so for me being here, that means the evening, which is like family time. You know, when right. you have when you have young children. So um, there were actually some logistical motivations as well for building a business that could be more on like my time and my terms the way that my life looks now. Um, but you know, I, I just, it's fun to start businesses. It's just the real answer. <laughs> it, it is fun to start businesses. I have that problem as well. So <laughs> I I'm really asking myself this question. Why do I always start right. something new? <laughs> but, um, but, but that does make sense as well. Right. I mean, if, if, if Edgar is doing well and it's run by a team really for the most part, um, that's in the U S um, mm -hmm. like where's, Where's your opportunity to really dive into something, right? And and kind of have that get into the workflow of something that can be new and exciting, right? Um, so so that makes sense. I mean, you have to have something that you are doing um, during your regular work hours as well. Yeah. So um, so I want to just give you a chance to talk a little bit more about Paperbell, uh, where the idea came from, and and what it does, what the the problem is that it's solving. Yeah, so Paperbell is for um, coaches and consultants. Basically, if your business model is you sell your time online, you know, coaching someone, advising someone, uh, it's software that does the billing and the scheduling and the client admin all in one place. And the idea came because actually I started doing some business coaching, because like you said, I need, I needed something to do. Like I wasn't really, you know, didn't have a lot to do with Edgar. I wasn't sure what my next thing was going to be. And I'm like, okay, I love, you know, chatting with people about business, coaching on business. So I'll start doing that. And I just assumed that there was going to be, I'm like, okay, so I need someone to like click a link and schedule and pay. And yeah. I just assumed that that was going to be a thing that was out there, like click a link, schedule and pay. But it turned out that it's sort of a thing like um, the calendar tools have payment often added on, you know, like you can do Calendly and you can like tack on your like PayPal or your Stripe account, but then you can't do things like um, have more than one session that you're selling or like have a subscription where, you know, you have like a session every month. As soon yeah. as it goes beyond just sort of like tack on that one time deal. payment, uh -huh. um, it, it kind of falls apart, you know, right. or... Like I looked at um, Clarity FM, who was kind of like an early player in the space, a little bit different because they focus more on like the marketplace side. Um, but Clarity FM, at least as of, I don't know, a year or two ago, didn't even have a scheduling tool. Like you, you buy a call from someone and then you just have to type in like, how about Tuesday? How about Thursday? You're kind of on your own after that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's weird. Um, 
So I just, that's how I discovered the need is just for my own business. And then of course I just started researching um, the coaching space, which, you know, there's a lot of overlap between coaches and online marketing and online courses. So I've never done any formal coach training or anything. I've hired coaches over the years. It's, it's just a space I've been sort of familiar with. Um, but I just started learning more about what a huge growing industry it is, you know, the needs that people have as a business. I'm just talking to coaches and learning um, what it would look like to be a software that was built very specifically for coaches. And that's, yeah. that's what's really fun about what we're doing now is because now we're in that phase. We're just like, we're just building what people ask for. So they're like, you know, we added on um, a registration fee. They're like, okay, well, I want to have this package, but then I actually charge a higher fee just for the first payment, like a setup fee or registration fee. So it's again, just these little nuances that are common in coaches. But if you're using kind of like a general software, aren't going to be able to do those details. So Right. It's so fun when someone's like, I want a setup fee. And then we're like, okay, we built it. Here's your setup fee. And like, this it. is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it is interesting, the market for coaches, it does seem like it, it's growing. Um, at mm. least just, um, I think as maybe the internet is maturing, right? Like before online coaching was not a thing, right? Mm. Um, and of course now it, it seems like it is growing. So I, I think it's a good market. Um, is there any particular type of coaches that are using your software most? Like, is it mostly like business coaches? We see a really huge diversity actually. And one of the really cool things is, you know, people, so we use the word coach, you know, very specifically in our marketing. So some people who use us identify as a consultant, but I would say most people do identify as a coach. And, um, you know, one guy that uses our software is a construction business coach because he coaches people mm. that run construction businesses on how cool. to run their businesses better. Um, we have grief coaches that help people who are grieving. It's just the word coach just really means that you help people with something, you know, right. so we definitely have, you know, more general like life coaches and business coaches, but then it's also just so fascinating. Oh, we have one person that uses our software. This is like a little bit like off, off label, but she does, she's a mermaid, like at children's birthday parties. <laughs> what? <laughs> so she has a mermaid business, which I think she does use paper. We're really more for online stuff, but I think she does use paper bell to like book her mermaid gigs, but then she has a coaching business. Huh like teaching people how to do like children's entertainment, you know, okay. businesses, because so many people become coach just like me, right? Like I do business coaching because I've run businesses and then I have mm -hmm. things to share. So it's fascinating how many people become coaches because they've come, become really good at a specific thing. They're like, I know how to run a children's, you know, entertainer party <laughs> business. I can help other people that want to do that too. So that's, that's what they do. Talk about niche right there. I mean, yeah. come on. <laughs> running a mermaid entertainment business of some sort. Um, interesting. I, I've actually got a buddy as a side note that uh, he owns dozens and dozens of costumes and he dresses up as Mario or Mickey Mouse. Or, okay. So he gets rented out at birthday parties all the time. He's, yeah. a, he's a quirky kind of guy. I don't think he's ever done the mermaid though. Um, so Next on his list. He can be a merman. A merman. I'll, I'll let him know <laughs> that uh, that could be a thing. So, um, no, that's, that's very good. So generally you, you touched a little bit on how paper bell was, was doing it. You know, it hasn't had the crazy to the moon trajectory yeah. that Edgar has yet, but just generally how, how's it going? Yeah. So we're at about a hundred K ARR, awesome. um, which I think is terrible. Just <laughs> for the record, You're I know that it's fine. <laughs> It's, just, it's nice to hear you say awesome. I'm like, okay, be reasonable, be a it's, reasonable person. It is awesome. Well, you have to think about, you know, people that are listening that have never started a business, right? To yeah. think about, oh man, 100,000 ARR, that's great. So you've got a little bit of traction, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's it's been just over a year, did you say? Yeah, just under. Just a under. Year. Okay. Um, yeah. And we have, uh, you know, the other thing I keep telling myself is it's been a very product focused year. Like we haven't done any experimentation with our pricing. You know, a lot of people are still on like our early founders, you know, founding member rate, which was 
really low um, because the focus really has been, okay, building out, like I said, just all the details, all the core functionality of what makes our software a really just home run. You know, we just want it to get it to the point where it's like, if you run a coaching business, it would just be ridiculous not to use this right. tool. It'll just make your life so much easier. So we are kind of still in that product, not that you get out of being product focused, but you know what I mean? Just like building up that yep. core, really excellent product. That's that's where we are in the journey right now. Yeah. No, that sounds good. Um, I love hearing that you've been able to sort of um, build something new, right? I, I like I'm an entrepreneur. I, I love having uh, new ideas and, and building new ideas as well. So I, I am thinking a little bit um, with, uh, Edgar, you know, you built a successful company there. You've essentially hired it out. You're not putting a lot of your own time there. Would you ever exit that business and just sort of take that business, that money and, um, you know, go vacation for a little while? Yeah. I mean, I think I will at some point right now, I have a pretty good win-win going, you know, because it's yeah. a good income stream for me, which also makes it a valuable business to sell. So I think that will be the eventual outcome. Um, you know, at some point the stars, the stars will align and yeah. that'll happen. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, we will see, you know, when that happens, if that happens, but, uh, no, I love, I love hearing about your story and what you've built, uh, of course with Edgar and then now, uh, paper bell, um, What's what's next for your business? Like in terms of paper bell, like what's sort of the next big thing, any big strategic moves that you're making or just um, anything else you want to let listeners know about? Yeah, I mean, I think, like I said, it's about building up that really amazing pro product. So we have something that's a lot better than what you had, but like if what you used before was, you know, like I said, Calendly, and then sometimes you sort of tack on your PayPal account. This is a lot better than that. What most coaches are doing is not, most coaches are just like emailing an invoice and then hoping that someone pays it. Maybe they have the coaching call in the meantime and the invoice hasn't even been paid yet. You know, this is kind of the normal way of doing things. So what, what I'm really excited about is just making this a new standard of how the industry is run. You know, like I look forward to when we have a bunch of copycats and because people always use a software like this, like whether or not they're using Paperbell, you're just using a tool like this. And actually, when we first launched, I was trying to describe it as I was thinking of it as sort of like Shopify for a service business in the sense that like Shopify is the tool you use to sell your offerings online. And we're right. very similar. You know, you have like your package offerings, Paperbell is the tool you use to deliver them with the calls and to sell them. Um, I found that did not resonate with our audience. <laughs> it made them feel very confused. Like, what's so Shopify I, again? <laughs> right. <laughs> so I don't say that from a marketing perspective, but that is kind of like, and not that, you know, I, I don't really imagine the business getting as big as shop up. Like my dream is not to have a business that's that big as far as, you know, revenue or team or all the ways that Shopify is huge. But um, I do think it's very inspiring how Shopify really changed their industry and really, you know, for you to be able to have an e-commerce business, if you have the product, they will help you accomplish everything else. And I, I love that idea that a coach could just be like, okay, I have my product. I sit down with people and help them for an hour and Paperbell can kind of do everything around that to make it a business. Yeah. Yep. I agree. So if people want to check that out, they can go to paperbell.com. And of course they can check out Edgar at meetedgar.com. Uh, is there anywhere else that you'd like to send people? No, those are the big ones. Go to those okay. two, sign up for trials of both of them. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Uh, well, very good, Laura. It has been great having you on the podcast. It's been a pleasure getting to know you a little bit better. And thanks for sharing all your tips and advice. Yeah, thank you.